big thank you to the guys at We Are Stoke for sponsoring my match day vlogs this season. You can check them out on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, linked in the description. Hey up guys, RBSFC here and today we are joined by Ben Rowley from the YYY Files. This is episode 5 of the Harvey SCFC podcast and today we're just going to be talking a little bit about Project Restart, um, the Bundesliga returning tomorrow and obviously whether you know or not, Ben runs his own podcast and part of that podcast is your best Stoke team, so I thought that'd be a, a good um, thing to talk about on this podcast. So, Ben, how are you? Um, I'm really good, mate. Thank you. Um, it's it's weird this because you just say I, I I do a podcast normally, but this is like people can see me. Um, I used to do it with Bear Pit, but but I, I'm exposed again finally after a couple of years. So you know, it's a bit weird, but yeah. But nice to be here all the time. Yeah, thank you very much for. Uh taking the time to come on um if you haven't didn't know already i have actually appeared on ben's podcast um back in june last year wasn't it mm. yeah. um so i'll leave a link to the why 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 files podcast in the description so first of all obviously whether you probably do know the bundesliga is coming back um ben i want to know your opinions on football returning as we are in well what is the middle of a worldwide pandemic yeah uh <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's it's different for every country. Of course, it is. Um, I don't pretend to be a coronavirus expert. I don't pretend to be an expert in anything. To be fair, um, at the end of the day, people's safety, whether it's the players, the staff, the the stadium staff, the the media, they have to be first and foremost the the most important thing. Surely. Um, if there's a way that they they can guarantee their safety as much as they can, um, yeah, football coming back is is a good thing, of course, because a lot of people are stuck inside with nothing to do, and football is a massive part of people's lives. Um, in in Germany, we know it's probably just as important as it is over here in England. Um, so I can see why they've tried to bring it back. I can see why they tried to bring it back in all countries. To be fair, just because of how important the money is to a lot of clubs and as I say, to people. Um but I'm 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 worried that these these plans are not good enough to protect the the people that are taking part. I I think the worst thing to have come of all this is we've done this a couple of months too quickly and we have players that are ill, whole squads that are ill or yeah. worse, you know, like Yeah. Who who knows? That'd be the worst thing to have come from this. That we seem to rush this for a little bit of entertainment when, you know, it, like there are lives at stake here, and, and and there is more to it. But as I say, I'm not an expert. They might have got it right. Um, these players are probably um, at at risk in their own lives, and some say if if these players are being forced to quarantine, maybe it's the safest place for them rather than just being released into the world. People like Carl Walker and that can't be doing what he's doing. Um, no. So, who knows? Who knows? But I, I, I'd, I'd like to think that we've got the balance right of getting football back so that people can be entertained and the economy, that the football and economy can keep going, um, but that they're safe as well. That's that's got to be priority number one. Yeah, the the thing that I don't really agree with it. Um, I'm more than happy to wait another mm. few months to make sure it's a hundred percent safe for everyone involved. Yeah. Um, it's it's the fact that someone could pick it up and pass it on to someone, you know, down the line. Um, yeah. I know Spencer Owen, uh, Spencer FC, made a very good video on it uh, yesterday, so I'll leave a link in, uh, to that video in the description. Um, but yeah, what he what he was saying, he thinks. Well, I think I think as well. I think it's just driven by money. I think it's a decision mm -hmm. being rushed. You know, we've we we not even two weeks past the peak and we're already thinking of right when can football come back it's, it's too soon it's not give it give it till august i'd say give it till august so everything's just you know somewhat back to normal and then we can start to discuss yeah i, I guess the thing is like these these people at the top would like to think know a lot more than what we do and and you'd hope that they are taking a more responsible decision than than we think we have knowledge to like 
we as the public only have information available to us to a certain degree. Like, yes, the news have been past the peak or whatever. Again, I'm I'm no expert, but you'd imagine that information of, of that would have come to these experts trying to figure out what's going on in society than to us a lot quicker. So for us, it might seem rushed to them. They might have known about this for a couple of weeks. We, it's, it's, it's really difficult, but we're learning more about it every day. And uh, yeah, I, I, I hope it's not rushed. I, I really hope it's not simply a money driven thing, but um, it most likely is given yeah. that football clubs it... could die off the back of this and, Obviously, we no no one wants p- people's clubs to, you know, mm. cease to exist. But I think they've they've got to get it right. I think mm. I don't know. It's it's really tough to think about. Um, yeah, I, I'd hate to have the job. You... I I really would like. I'd I'd hate to be in this position. I know that these people get paid a lot of money, and they're probably finally earning their bread by having to make these big decisions. But I. I I'd certainly hate to be making these calls because you, their their lifelong reputations could be made off the back of this. Yeah, but moving aside to that, mm-hmm. um, Bundesliga is coming back. Are you are you uh, adopting a team? Ha <laughs> Um. So uh, a couple of years ago, I did like a short trip with the guys and watched some uh, Bundesliga football. Went to Leverkusen, watched them play Werder Bremen. Um, went to have a tour of Dortmund Stadium and I watched Schalke versus Augsburg, I think, um, at the Veltins Arena. I don't know if it's renamed since then, but uh, they excellent. I, I, I really got into the Bundesliga. I, I also watched a St. Pauli friendly um, in Hamburg with Stoke. That, that was excellent as well. Just love German football. Um, don't watch enough of it as I'd like. Uh, if I'm going to pick a team, I know that people have been picking teams for random reasons. It's going to be unpopular because loads of people like Dortmund. I actually quite like Schalke. I don't know why. Yeah, same um, here. Think, yeah, I think they've had a lot of good young players come through. Um, their slogan, I think, is we love you. And it's sort of printed on the back of their shirts yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why. But I, yeah, I just like Schalke. Don't, yeah, irrational. Same but, here. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's more of a heritage-based thing with me. It's because... <laughs> Obviously, they've got quite similar um, stuff to Stoke, like the hard-working mm. city. You know, they come from coal mining. I know we were pottery, but we still had coal in, yeah. in Stoke on Trent. So it's it's really similar. And um, yeah, big game tomorrow, the derby. Oh, yeah, be good, be good. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it, and I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the Bundesliga and um, what they do and how we can maybe learn stuff from it and maybe I don't know it's it's either going to go well or it's not going to go very well and I'm hoping it's the uh, the first point I mentioned and it's going to go well everyone's going to be kept safe and it's going to be done in the right way yeah you'd, you'd like to think so I mean if we're talking about project restart in England um they say they're not going to be playing football till what middle of June or something like that. They're not going back to training until the end of May. Um, and if we say we've only just passed the peak, well, German football, the Bundesliga, is probably a month ahead of us in terms of getting back to getting started again. But they can't have had their peak too long ago either. I know that Germany have handled the virus differently to us. As I say, every country is different at the moment. But they, they, they're going to be like on a similar path to us, if not, maybe bringing football back sooner. Um, so there's there's reason to say that English football's got a lot to learn from what Germany are doing. <laughs> it's a shame that they're the guinea pigs and all this, but um, some would say that you trust the Germans with sort of planning and executing and stuff like that. So hopefully, hopefully they've done it right and we can learn off the back of that. But yeah, as I say, the main thing, I just hope all the teams are safe and all the all the staff and the maintenance staff and the media hope they all sort of come out okay. Um, these this sort of distance tackling or whatever. I I don't know. I I don't think Andy Wilkinson would be doing very well <laughs> if he wasn't be, if he wasn't allowed to be touching anybody. But uh, yeah, we'll see. I suppose. The the final point I wanted to mention about this project restart thing was you've got 
to try and not get fans gathering outside the ground. But then even if you disperse that crowd, they could then go to a mate's house and go and watch the game. Mm. I think that's another problem why I don't think it should be returning to uh, the, at the moment. Yeah. It's because, you know, even you, you might not be going to a pub, you might be going to a mate's house in, you know, someone's private land and police can't really do anything about it. So I think I, I think they need to get it in the right place sort of thing. They can't rush it. Um, mm. That's something as well that not many people have mentioned is the fact that people will go around people's houses to watch the games to get some yeah. form of atmosphere. Yeah. You know. And unfortunately, that's that's not going to stop until we're we're allowed back into stadiums. You know, that's that's yeah. the worst thing. Like, if if we're saying, oh well, cancel the season, start the new one in September. Well, no, we're going to have the same problem. Like, if football's still on TV, people are going to be gathering around stadiums, going around people's houses. Maybe that's okay by that point. We don't know. Um, but, but at, at this point, it's, it's yeah, not exactly. At it's, this point, now. Who knows? Like, I I hope people are sensible, but we know already that some people aren't, and this is just another excuse to break yeah. break the rules. And yeah, I know if it does come back, I know the Bundesliga tomorrow. I'll be watching the uh, Schalke versus Dortmund game on my mm. own in quarantine. You know, following yep. government guidelines. But I know some people <laughs> unfortunately won't be, and it'll be uh, longer before we actually get. The norma- the normality of football back in the stadiums mm. with your friends and family and uh, who knows who knows but who we're going to get on to we're going to get on to the uh, the main reason why we got Ben on uh, if, again I've just mentioned in the intro uh, Ben runs a podcast called the YYY Files and a segment of that podcast is the Files FC Ben do you want to explain what the Files FC is because yeah, okay, so um, I guess if I talk about the roots of the podcast, so uh, the idea of the podcast is they're Stoke City stories and they're told by you, sort of Stoke fans. Um, the idea is I get a new Stoke fan on each time and I ask them about their um, experience, relationship, sort of journey with Stoke. Um, and part of that interview is I ask them for their favourite Stoke eleven. Um, not necessarily the greatest players, just the players that they've got the most personal connection to. Um, and then each player that gets in the scene gets a vote, and that goes towards the main, what I call the Files FC. Um, taking all the, like, <laughs> I call the podcast a file, and it's like it's all the files put together, all the votes put together, and you've got like a main team. So perhaps the most loved team, not necessarily the best Stoke team in the world. I think. Uh, Someone mentioned on Twitter the other day that there's a certain lack of some of the older players, which is something we might come on to today. Um, but these are players that have been likely seen, that that have been seen by people that come on the podcast, so maybe younger fans, and they're not going to see the likes of Jackie Marsh or people like that. Um, they're going to have seen Andy Wilkinson instead, so he makes the team. Um, and, and and there's lots of familiar faces. But that's that's the idea behind it. It's just a... Trying to trying to finally get what is the best Stoke team or the most favourite Stoke team anyway. Yep. So I did a file on um, the Wild 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 Files. I've made a few tweaks to my team. This is my best team. <laughs> my favourite yeah. team was the one that you can go and check out on the Wild Wild Files. Um, again, that'll be in the description to Spotify. Um, so Ben, do you want to kick us off with a goalkeeper? Mm, yeah, so so I've gone down a similar route. Um, I'm saving my favourite eleven for when I finally do my sort of wow, wow, wow files, I guess. Uh, so so this is what I believe to be the the greatest Stoke team, um, and I'm pretty sure you're going to pick the same one as me if if you're doing yours. Um, Gordon Banks, <laughs> um, just uh, n- not only possibly Stokes greatest goalkeeper the greatest goalkeeper to have ever been you know um yeah. a time for stoke just after winning the world cup um after being transfer listed by leicester because they preferred peter shelton because he was a bit younger um so he signed him for 50k back in the day um tony waddington wanted him so much that um leicester was supposed to pay banks sort of a compensation fee for asking him to leave um 
and Banks believed that Leicester did pay that in the end, but it was actually Stoke that paid it. Um, they they wanted Banks that much. Um, of course, he was part of the team that won the League Cup in 1972, the only major thing we've ever won. Um, yeah. And of course, had that horrendous injury um, not long after. Um, one thing I didn't know about what he had done, he had 200 stitches <laughs> to fix that. Uh, of course, he had that car accident and he lost his sight in one eye, but he had 200 stitches and 100 micro stitches in his eye. Pfft, flipping heck. And then he did retire from professional football, but he carried on afterwards. He went to, I think, America and played some football there. Yeah. Um, but the thing about Banks is he's he's... People talk about his saves, like his moments, and you don't really get that with goalkeepers. Um, you say, oh, like, oh, I don't know, Van der Sar was a really solid goalkeeper, but with Banks, he's produced moments, not just for England, for Stoke as well. Um, I think he said that the three best saves he'd ever made were in a Stoke shirt. Um, and it, he, he was just fantastic. He was known for constantly talking to his players, trying to get them alert. He always said that if he's got a save to make, then his first job of organising his defence has failed. Um, and just club legend, without a doubt. Club president, of course, as well, before he passed away last year. Um, yeah, Gordon Banks has to be, surely, right? 100%. I agree with you there. Uh, he did actually make it into my foul FC. Mm. There's no better goalkeeper we've ever had. Um, no. The, the closest you're probably going to get is Asmir Begovic or Jack Butland, um, when Butland first broke through, I think that injury that Butland had didn't. He he probably wouldn't be at the club anymore. He'd have gone on to bigger and better things um, had he not got that injury. But uh, who knows? Who knows? Hmm. Um, yeah, hundred percent. Gordon Banks, best keeper to play in an England shirt. Best keeper in a Stoke shirt. You're not gonna. You're not gonna find anyone better than that. No, absolutely. So we move on to the back four. Mm. Uh, where should I start? Right back or centre back? What do you think? Uh, jump work across from the right hand side. So we start yeah. right back. Okay, so right back. I've gone for Jackie Marsh, um, local lad uh, who joined back in 1964. Um, he was with Stoke for pretty much his whole career. Um, again, was part of that team that won the League Cup in 1972, that sort of Tony Waddington era. Um, it was quite weird for somebody at that time, though. He was um, almost a modern-day fullback-esque player where he was good in his own penalty area, but he was good at going forward as well. Um, had a had a wicked cross on him. Um, he, he never played for England, but some say that if he was at a club like Manchester United, which, you know, Stoke were pretty good in the Tony Waddington area, you know, at first division... Um, you you make fair claim to say that he should have played for England, um, but people say that if he'd have played at you know United or something, then he definitely wouldn't have done. Um, when the uh, the Butler Street stand, I think it was that collapsed um, at the Victoria Ground, um, and Stoke had to sell loads of players to generate funds to rebuild that. Um, Marsh said, "No, I want to stay at Stoke," um, and he did so until I think he had an injury or something, or he, was, or he got a free transfer a couple of years later. Uh, just just because he got older, but he was sort of Stoke born and bred, um, yeah. and and a good modern day fullback, I guess, in a, in an era that wasn't really full of modern day fullbacks. For me, I've gone Andy Wilkinson again, local lad, pretty much his whole career at Stoke. He basically is a modern day uh, Jackie Marsh. Mm. Um, the amount of times he had to come off a bandage or you know a, yeah bandage and still played on it shows what sort of player he was he, he'd literally run through a brick wall for the club mm. um and yeah he deserves to make my best 11 mm. yeah yeah that's fair enough i mean wilco like it's it's tough because these players played in different eras, so th- some would say they're incomparable. Like they even play with different weights of football and something daft like that. Yeah. Different sort of quality of pitches. But Wilco, like the the tackles he put in and how much he cared and his his sort of journey from I think he went through three promotions with Stoke or something like that. That like that's that's insane. 
and he went through European football, FA Cup finals, and and his his story is absolutely fantastic. It, it's any fan's dream, really. Yeah, um, it, yeah. And um, uh, someone surely you'd, you'd you'd love to meet as a Stoke fan, and um, maybe more of a personal touch, I think, with him. Uh, I, I think he he lacked in certain areas, as I'm sure that he'll admit to, but he made up for it in the fact that he he loved Stoke, and he was never gonna leave or anything like that but he he, he he bloody loved us and it's and it's good to see from our point of view in the stands it was good that he got that testimonial and a send off he really did deserve yeah you know that penalty right at the end <laughs> yeah yeah that was good I remember sitting in the the upper tier of the Q railing stand for that game so um, I wasn't able to do the pitch invasion unless I sort of jumped off the balcony uh, but <laughs> I remember catching a good video of that actually and, and just him scoring the penalty and seeing all the fans go for him finally like oh. it's a shame he didn't get that goal in the FA Cup semi-final no uh, against I was Bolton. about to bring that up yeah yeah um, damn it <laughs> heartbreak <laughs> yeah it's, it's one of them things though isn't it uh, mm. but at least he got you know he gave everyone that moment everyone that was in that ground at his testimonial he gave everyone that really special moment, and I think a lot of Stoke fans will treasure that moment. Mm. Oh. You know, the fact that they had to call the game off early because they couldn't get <laughs> everyone off the pitch. Oh, yeah, the game that never ended. It, his testimony is still happening, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Fair play to him. And speaking of testimonials, we'll move on to the centre backs. I've gone for Ryan Shawcross and Robert Hoof. Obviously, speaking mm-hmm. of testimonials, Ryan Shawcross is going to be due one. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess he's going to get it when he retires. Um, I've got a feeling. I think last uh, next season might be his last season. Obviously, mm-hmm. he's not a spring chicken anymore. Uh, but the amount of he's given for this club, you know, no Stoke fan can pay him back. Oh no, like Brian Shawcross makes my team as well. Um, even with all these legendary centre backs and whatever else have you that we've had, like he he really is a modern day legend. I don't think that's an understatement either. Um he's got almost four hundred and fifty appearances for Stoke, which is numbers that you're talking about when player is only played for one club really. Um signed for a million pounds back in the day from Manchester United. Um Got the eighth most appearances for Stoke of all time. Like, it, it, it captained yeah. us through our best ever era, some would say. Um, he, he's just such an important part of Stoke. He's a fantastic centre back, no nonsense. He's exactly what we're about. He he will have learned that surely coming through our system and being part of our journey. You're right, absolutely due a testimonial. Some say he needs a statue. Um, it, what a player Ryan Shawcross is. Like a lot of people mention him on the Files FC, uh, actually, and they say Ryan Shawcross is a legend. What else can I say about him that nobody else has said? I'll move on. Um and it's and, and it's and it's that the fact that people think that he gets spoken about all the time is almost testament enough. Like people know who Ryan Shawcross is if you're around here and <sighs> household name, fantastic blow, done lots of great things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. And if pe- people... Well, I, I still think he's having an impact on, on the squad. Now, if you look at the games mm. he's played in this season, the one appearance he made for 90 minutes this season was the Sheffield Wednesday game on Boxing Day. Mm. Say no more. Exactly, right? Yeah. And and you see, I, I don't know what video it was, and I'm not sure who pointed it out either, uh, but when Vokes got that goal at the end... Um, and Vokes was about to run back uh, to, to the halfway line or the other side of the pitch ready to restart the game. And Ryan Shawcross actually put his arm on his chest and said, no, slow down, stop, we're in the last minute of the game, don't lose it now, <laughs> like, waste a bit of time. He's got his head screwed on 100%. His concentration doesn't lapse, and we've seen that from so many players over the years where their, their, their concentration just dips. And that's why we've been suffering all these stupid defeats, especially under Nathan Jones, I think. Um, yeah. Like I say, he's got almost 450 appearances. You're talking about when he retires. I hope he gets to 500. Um, mm. it'd, 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 it'd be a big ask. He'd have to play almost every game next season. And if the reason 
if the season continues this season, then probably a few of those as well. Um, I hope he gets to 500, and I'm sure that's what he's aiming for as well. Um, but yeah, he, unfortunately, injuries and age and stuff like that, he, he's not going to be with us the for cruel long. things in football. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yes, he absolutely needs to make the team, 100%. And I know you were mentioning about that Sam Folks uh, celebration just then. Yeah. He actually, he, you know, when Tyrese got the equaliser, it was McLean and Bat that went over to him to start mm. celebrating. Ryan runs over and tells them, you know, come on, we can get another one here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was so influential. That's um, it. He, 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 he just genuinely got his head screwed right on. Like, yes, he's probably as emotional bloke as anybody. We've seen that on the pitch when we've done really well but he's he's proper the 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 best professional the the best professional i think we've ever seen yeah definitely in there for my team and his partner in crime back in the pulis days robert tooth mm-hmm. yeah yeah again what more to say he's <laughs> just an absolute brick wall um <laughs> And yeah, he's just really got, got that goal at Wembley. Yeah. He, again, he's he's exactly like Ryan. Them two mm. together at the back was amazing. Yeah. Oh, like Hooth was absolutely fantastic. Like the definition of no nonsense. If we were talking about you know Brian Shawcross being no nonsense, Robert Hooth was mental. Um, <laughs> the fact that he didn't want to get bandaged up, uh, saying he didn't have time to bleed after he got that head injury. Um, he 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 would have committed murder to stop somebody scoring a goal. I think, um, yeah. And, and obviously, hilarious bloke on social media as well. We've seen that uh, good character in the dressing room by all accounts. Did very well with Leicester. Um, must admit though, I I haven't gone with Robert Hooks as much as it pains me to say so. Um, I think it's only fair that Dennis Smith gets a mention in this team. Possibly Stokes, one of Stokes' greatest centre backs. Well, I think so anyway, he's on the team obviously. Uh but objectively I think a lot of people would say that Smith was fantastic. You know, he played nearly five hundred games for Stoke. Um scored forty two goals for a sort of centre back, which is nuts that's, really. That's more than some yeah, attackers we've had in exactly the last right. Years. <laughs> some 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 players that are in this team that are forwards, exactly. Um he he sort of joined as a youth player as well. He's um he's from Mir. Um he sort of joined um I, I I don't think Tony Wellington really wanted him because he was such a hard, brutal defender. Like he said, he was almost too rough. Um, and then he said that he was going to sign for somebody else. So Wellington signed him up in the end. And, and what a decision that was. He also was part of the year that won the 1972 League Cup, as, as a lot of these players, I'm sure, that I'll, I'll mention uh, will have done. Just the definition of commitment. You know, uh, he had an operation after that League Cup. Um and I think he had some cartilage removed from his knee. Um, he was never the same again. Like, he didn't have the same pace. Uh, but but he was still such a good, committed, quality player. Uh, one club player as well, as I mentioned. Yeah. And he still does stuff today. Like, he's on Radio Stoke a lot of the time, talking about Stoke. Um, was, was highly tipped, actually, um, to be the club president after Gordon Banks died. I don't think they've ever replaced Banks as club president, actually. I don't think they got around to doing no, that yet. Yeah. they... Well, they will, but uh... they mentioned it at the um, fan forum. Uh, mm. Geez, that's nearly two months ago now. Yeah, uh, yeah, they mentioned it at the fan forum, and um, mm. they they said they didn't have any plans to do it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think he, he I think Smith would be the top of most people's list just because he he really is Stoke through and through. Like I say, nearly five hundred games for us from the area, and. He's exactly what we're about, you know, that that committed, hard tackling centre back that took no nonsense and like like Hooth, I suppose. That's mm. that's the best comparison. He he was uh he was the, the pottery's Hooth, I guess we could call him. Yep, and someone else, um we'll move on to left back now, and someone else that absolutely loves Stoke and even now even though he's not at the club anymore, he's still you know, still interacts with uh, Duck Magazine on Twitter and still openly says he loves us. Mark Moniessa. Hmm. I've, I've had to break the rules a bit, but 
you allow that on your <laughs> podcast. I've put Moniesa oh, yeah, at left yeah. back. I've put him at left back. So um, yeah, Mark Moniesa, brilliant. Part of the the three amigos as I used to call them. Uh, Arnold, uh, not Arnold, bitch. Bojan, <laughs> Bojan, Moniesa, and Hosselu. There's that picture of them in front of the booth and end. Um, yeah, absolutely love Moniesa, and I'd, I'd love to see him come back one day. Just one day, oh. I want to see him back in Stoke shirt. Oh, it, it'd be that fantastic. song. That song we used to sing, the La Bamba, <laughs> magical. Oh, like the thing is with Moniesa, he he was such an unStoke player. He, he was almost too on Stoke in a way. You, you know what I mean? Like he, yeah. He said he sort of modelled himself for like off of Carl's Puyol, um, because he he doesn't need to be big. He doesn't need to be physical. He just needs to be clever. And by God, he was such a clever centre full back wherever he played defensive midfield. Sometimes he he was just an intelligent player. You'd you'd see him in these positions and you think, why the hell has he placed himself there? And he just knows he's just got to intercept the ball and take it away, like he did against Burnley, and then obviously started the counter-attack and he finished off his own move in the end. That. I was about to yeah. bring that up, yeah. Just, what, a, what a piece of play that was. What a piece of play that was. He, he was more than just a centre-back, he was a quality player. Um, mm. And I think, unfortunately, it just for whatever reason, it just... He worked well with Shawcross, but he didn't work well for the situation that we were in, I think, because we were at a time where we needed a bit more brawn, a little bit less flair. He he just sort of fizzled out here, and and I think he deserved a a bigger move than what he got, to be honest, because he's in like Saudi Arabia now or something, death like that. Like, he Um, he deserves more. He went on loan to Girona, didn't they? And then he he permanently. It was if Girona stayed up, they can. Sign him permanently, so he, they signed him permanently. Mm. Then they got relegated. Then he ended up. I think it was. I think he's in Qatar at the moment. Yeah, something like that, isn't it? Yeah, I forgot about Jerome actually. He course, move there because um, local local team, I guess, for him, isn't it? Um, yeah. But no, Munez is great. I haven't gone for him in mine. I've uh, <laughs> I've gone back to the old days. Uh, I've gone for Mike Pedrick. Uh, a, a yeah. lot of people will know Pedrick uh, more from. The rents on the Sentinel and on the radio, I think now. Uh, but but he he was a fantastic player as well. Uh, 344 appearances back in the day. Um, again, part of that sort of Tony Waddington era. Yeah. Um, he's from Chesterton. Started off as a winger in his youth. I think he played for Newcastle on the line as sort of an amateur. And then sort of Tony Waddington brought him in and turned him into a, a, a left back. Um, he was the definition of that shall not pass. You know, he was no. <laughs> like, we're talking about Smith and Huth being like, nah, Pedrick was insane. Um, yeah. And he was an absolute fitness fanatic. He, he sort of, he was a farmer as well as being like a stoke player. So he used to take his fitness very, very seriously. Um, just, just nuts. He had a sweet left foot. Um, he, he actually played for England as well. Only four games, but you know, a, a rarity for Stoke City, you know, and, and, not many players played for England had... apart from it. Well, maybe you're across Scotland in recent years, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, if you're across exactly. Scotland. Tyrese's, Tyrese's yeah. making appearances in the under twenties, I think. Yeah. Tom Edwards was at the European Championships with the under twenties as well. I want to say. Yeah. Um, That's it. it might have been that. It might have been in the twenty ones. I'm not sure. Um, but again, speaking of. Stoke players in the England setup. There's no excuse why Tyrese can't make it in a couple of years. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah like if he, you think he, about, he's a good striker. English strikers, exactly. If you think about English strikers now, you've got Harry Kane. I'd probably say he's got next year's Euros and the World Cup after in him. Um, mm. Then you've got players like Dominic Calvert Lewin, who I think Tyrese will be better than in a couple of years. Um, if Tyrese keeps working hard, then you know you've got. You got That's a great striker. That's the thing. Like um, Tyrese has got to do the right things. I'm not saying that stay at Stoke is necessarily the right one. It, it, you would say it is because he's doing very well at Stoke. And sometimes these young players sort of give up on a good thing too early. Look what Nick Powell did. You know, he was so good at Crew. Went to Man United, and ended up at Wigan. You know, <laughs> like he, yeah, he probably deserves so much better than that by sort of biding his time a little bit. Um, he's obviously ended up at the greatest club in the world. Um, but yeah, Tyrese Campbell needs to just be careful because he's such a fantastic talent and he's finally got himself in a team that will give him 90 minutes and he's thriving in 
and there's talks of him leaving and talks of lots of players leaving, I suppose. But um, he he's got to be careful. He doesn't leave too early to to a massive club that aren't going to play him and just going to. We've seen so many English talents like I don't know. Let, let's think Jack Radwell, like uh, Brass Barkley. These these players that were just absolutely fantastic as youth prospects and then just rotted at these big clubs. Even with low moves, they're not the same. Um, some would argue that Harry Kane did 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 all right on loan and then finally got his chance at Spurs. But that's it. He, he needs to be playing for the team that he's owned by. I think. I think mm. loans are great, um, but there's there's nothing like playing for a club that that you're owned by because yeah. you, you just care that little bit more. I think. And so I hope he does stay with us for a couple of years, and we'll see. That's something I brought up in last week's uh, podcast with uh, Elliot. I said to mm-hmm. him, you know, we've got Nathan Collins and Mo Sanko loaned away. So big, very big clubs, like worldwide phenomenons, Arsenal, Juventus, Chelsea, you've got some really big clubs. The thing that they can't, they, they're not going to get at those clubs that, that they will get at Stoke is a chance to play first-team football on a regular basis. Because if, if you look at Chelsea, that that's a star-studded team. Mm-hmm. And if you look at Mo Sanko, it's going to become really difficult for him to break through. Yeah, You know, look at some of the players they've got and look at, you know, Tammy Abraham. He's he's in the England setup, so it's going to become really difficult for young Mo to, mm-hmm. to you know, to get him out of the team. And Chelsea have got all this money that they're not as interested as we would be to bring in youth products because they can just splash the money on the next best thing, as we've seen. Um, we'll see Man City do this summer because they've got David Silva leaving. I can't see Phil Foden getting into their first team. They'll just sign, you know, the next best attacking midfielder. As long yeah. as it's not Sam Klukas, I'm all right. <laughs> I think I think Sam Klukas is a little bit too old for them, um, in fairness. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, let, let's hope Tyrese does the right thing. Let's hope Mo Sanko does the same thing. Let's hope that all the young players we have, because I, I listened to that last podcast that you did, and, and you mentioned a lot of good young players that we've got. Um, and, and yeah, we could have, if, if we really wanted to, I think, in a couple of seasons, we could have a team of youth players. Um, like that, that just won't happen. But um, we, we've really got some good talent coming through. Um, and, and I'm talking about the Tony Waddington area quite a lot um, on this podcast. They were a lot of homegrown players. I talk about Smith, I talk about Pedic, um and Marsh as well. Um, and and there'll be a couple more, I'm sure, that are from Stoke as well. And and that that's the main thing. Brilliant. Like, oh, like it it means a lot more when you sort of graduate from a club. Like, look at what it means to Harry Kane. Like, he, I think he'd have left Spurs two, three years ago had he not been through the ranks at Spurs and wanting to do well at Spurs and like being Spurs the top goal scorer or or like the Premier League top goal scorer for Spurs, like or yeah. under Spurs. Like, it just means a lot. I'd be like that anyway. It, like even if it wasn't Stoke, if I was uh, <laughs> someone really unfashionable, Watford. If I was like sort of graduating through Watford's academy, and like I'd personally, I'd love to be like a one club player if money was no object. Like obviously signing fees and whatever. But uh, yeah, surely being a one club player means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah, if I got the opportunity to somehow have a professional football career. <laughs> I'd, I'd only want to be at Stoke, you know, it's my club, you know. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, mm. you know, because I've got that connection with the fan base. I know, you know, what, what our ethos is and I wouldn't say I fit the ethos on the pitch, mm. but, you know, I'm, I just love the club, I love the city and it's something that, that, that really made that 72 squad really successful is because some of, some of them aren't, locals but the part of Stoke this part yeah. of Stoke on Trent now you know yeah. you still you've seen them they they've moved here because they yeah they love the city yeah that's the thing we spoke about that quite a lot actually sort of the Stoke City old boys and uh so many people move here like if we're talking modern day Liam Lawrence Mabadi Sadibi Ricardo Fuller uh Rory exactly. Delap Jonathan Walters like they're all it involved with Stoke to some degree 
and like these these weren't just like players that couldn't get anything after they retired. You know, these are properly good players, um, yeah. and we're we're grateful to have them. But they they like they they wanted to be here. Look at how much Liam Lawrence wanted to get into the Stoke City setup. I'm sure he could have got one at a different club if he'd have wanted, but he wanted to be part of the Stoke setup. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're people as well. I think we forget <laughs> that with football sometimes. Like, yeah. um, they must grow such an affinity with football clubs sometimes, especially if they go through eras like we had in the Premier League and with Waddington and whatever. So, yeah. We're going to move back to the team now after the, mm. the short tangent we uh, did find ourselves <clears> on. But that's what podcasting is all about. Exactly. Um, we're going to move on to the, the midfield now. Um. I've gone for a 4 3 3. I'm not sure if I've mentioned it um, before. I've gone for two holding CDM sort of roles and then an attacking midfielder. So I'm sure you'll know who's going in at Cam. And then I've gone for a front three um, yeah. as well. So if you want to start us off with your two, well, your midfield. Okay, yeah, sh- sure. So I've, I've, uh, I've gone 4 4 2. Um, just because, like, sort of nominating two wingers, two midfielders, yeah. two strikers just seems sort of nice to me. I don't know. Like, obviously, it's your podcast. You can do what you want. Um, <laughs> I've gone for one from the Waddington era again, um, but one modern day as well. Um, so I've gone for Jimmy Greenoff um, yeah. in midfield. Uh, 346 appearances for Stoke. Um, again, in the Waddington era, signed for 100,000, um, won the League Cup in 1972. Um, possibly the greatest England player to never receive a cap, um, with, like just in, insane player, like fantastic for Stoke. Had had sort yeah. of partnerships and connections with the, the people of like Alan Hudson and people like that, and just he's the seventh all-time highest goal scorer for Stoke. Now, when you think about that, he scored 103 goals from midfield essentially. Yes, yeah. it might have been attacking midfield, but midfield, you know, he was only with us for seven years, like a hundred goals. In seven years, like what you'll have had injuries and stuff be like proud that. Proud of that record, exactly right. Like, like I think the ratio I'm trying to work out now is nearly one in three. Like Jesus Christ, um, yeah. You know, it was good with both feet. These dangerous late runs into the box, similar to I don't know someone like I'm sure you'll be mentioning in your team. Um, loved a no look pass as well. Apparently, <laughs> mm. I, I don't know whether no look passes were much of a thing then, but maybe he was the uh, the connoisseur of a no look pass. Yeah, but, I'd yeah, have just player. loved to. I'd have loved to been alive in in those days. Like, mm. you know, football on my level. You know, Stoke were doing really well. England were winning the World Cup. They had a really good squad. You know, it must have been brilliant to to be alive in those days. And obviously, mm. you've got the Victoria Ground that I, I, I always want to know what it was like on a match day. And yeah, I know there was that um, mini film that came out um, that a fan made. Uh, can't remember the name but um i gave that a watch and it it sort of made me feel like i was there and it's like the old booth and end. you don't think of the booth and end now you think of the booth and end at the bet 365 and you just look at it and it's like wow yeah like the old terrace scene it, it, i'd have loved to have gone and watched a game there um <laughs> but unfortunately yeah. the the ground was Kind long it gone takes, right? We're too young. <laughs> yeah. The ground was long gone before I was even born. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What can you do? Uh, can luckily, you do? there is people who did make videos at the game, sort of like what I do, but um, they it was, it was a good 30 minutes and it was really well put together. Mm. You know, it's walking from the car, across the car park, over the little... I know the river Trent ran almost up to the ground, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I don't know much about the Victoria Ground. Um, I know that it was bigger than the Britannia Stadium. I think it was like fifty thousand or something like that. Yeah. Um, and and I've uh, mentioned the Butler Street stand uh, cave in and under that storm and Stoke basically had a fire sale to get rid of all their players so that they could rebuild the stand again. Um, but yeah, like that. That era is fantastic, and it's why I've mentioned so many players from from that era in this team so far. Um, might lean away from that a little bit going forward. Um, so, for example, my other midfielder um, is Stephen Zonzi. 
Um, many people would say the, one of the best players that Stoke has ever had, technically, yeah. period. Um, played 120 games for Stoke, um, joined for, I think, £3 million from Blackburn or something like that, and what a steal he was. We obviously sold him for way less than we should have done as well, but um, yeah, just he, he, he was so calm and composed. I think we take that for granted these days. Yeah. <laughs> Mentioned this with Bunny from Duck Magazine, actually, um, on a podcast. And he said that he had a funny knack of finding a player um, wearing the same colour shirt as him. And it's true. We're like, yeah. how many players have we seen over the years that give the ball away in stupid positions? We see it with people like Joe Allen and Sam Lucas, like players that we talk about in really high esteem. And yet they can't find <laughs> a pass. And then Zonzi could. And it wasn't just backwards and sideways. Yes, he did start off that way, but he eventually drove to be a more forward attacking yeah. player. And it all culminated in that massive 6 1 win over Liverpool. And he was, I th- that's possibly one of the greatest performances from a player I've ever seen. He was skillful. His vision was immaculate. Um, his goal was possibly the most underrated Stoke goal, I, I think. Like people talk about Crouch's yeah. goal and. I don't know, maybe Cameron Jerome's massive yeah. volley from wherever, but that goal from Nzanzi, because there were so many goals in that Liverpool game, just pff, like yeah. fantastic finish. Um, shame he loved a transfer request, really. Um, it did one basically every season, and then every season since after he left Stoke. Because um, I think apart from that, he, he'd have been a legend somewhere. Um Obviously, won the World Cup and stuff, and won the Europa League twice with Sevilla, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Some, something like that. But yeah, uh, and Zonzi for me, pr- probably just as good as Greenhoff, um, in in a different way, sure. Um, but yeah, what a talented footballer he was for us. Again, Stephen. Oh, again, <laughs> Stephen and Zonzi. I couldn't put it better myself. Um, yeah, uh, what a player he was, and. Only two of the players that have made my team have actually won the World Cup. Mm. The, we've had a couple of World Cup winners play for us. Obviously, mm. they might not have won it when they played for us, but they've yeah, gone yeah, on, yeah. either gone on or won it previously to us uh, to them being yeah. here. What would be absolutely amazing, though, is a player to win the World Cup whilst they're a Stoke player. That'd be... Maybe Tyrese Campbell, right? <laughs> All I'm saying, 2026. <laughs> um, Jaden Sancho is going to whip a ball in, and Tyrese is just going to nod it home. Absolute limbs. The dream. Oh, that would be brilliant. Stoke will be a top four Premier League club by then. Don't worry. <laughs> um, That's if we, we see the World Cup again. Jesus. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, but partnering and Zonzi in holding midfield, I've gone for Glenn Whelan. What a player. Um, yeah. He, he, you can't, words can't describe how good some of these players were. Whelan, I mean, I think a reason why a lot of people don't put him in his team, and I spoke to Pete Smith from the Sentinel. Um, and, and he didn't put him in his files, FC, because he said it, if he did, he'd have lost that underrated tag that he's given by everybody. Yeah. And in fact, he's so underrated that he's not overrated, but he is actually rated. He's he, like, yeah. it's, it's it's a weird uh, dilemma, I guess. But like we talk about commitment. He was as good as they came. We talk about leaders. He was as good as they came. Um, probably changed because he started out as like a box to box and then changed to more of a deep line later yeah. on in his career. Um, but like we we just couldn't get rid of him, and that's that's a good thing in the end. You know, it, it's a bad thing because like we we never could replace him while he was there, and we never have replaced him since he's gone. Yeah. Maybe only in a couple of recent games. Maybe I don't know. Jordan Thompson's looked half decent when he's actually he's played really there. Good. Um, yeah, exactly, and and maybe he could fill his shoes, but. Uh, Whelan was the irreplaceable player, not just for his ability, but for his character on the pitch as well. Um, yeah. Proper... I know. And I think it was Elliot Hatney that mentioned it on your, uh, in the file one. Um, I know he said, no matter how much 
we tried to replace him, no matter how much we splashed, no matter how many times we tried to do it, he'd still be named in that first eleven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but that's the thing, right? He, he, it'd always be at the start of the season where we'd we'd try somebody else. We'd always go for something else, whether it was, I don't know, like a Dean White said Rory to that midfield or a Nzonzi and uh, God, now I'm trying to think, Imbula, something yeah. like that. Um, I don't think they ever played together, but psh, whatever. <laughs> uh, but but like, yeah, he he'd always sort of get that game maybe like October, November and he'd play really well and then he'd stay yeah. in the team and that'd be it for another season and then we'd go back to the summer and go right, we need to replace Glenn Whelan, who do we try this season? Oh, no, we can't do it again. No, just I, know, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Like, I've got a few mates who are Aston Villa fans and when during his time there, they rated him so highly and they always they always sing his praises. He's not, he's not the most glamorous player no. for a club like Stoke and Aston Villa but he got the job done and that's what you want from your team from your players mm. like couldn't care less who's playing for us as long as they give 110% and perform well and that's exactly what we got from Glenn, Glenn Whelan oh yeah yeah definitely like I can completely see why Whelan makes makes any sort of best team um, yeah again incomparable to a lot of eras because did you need a City midfielder in some days. I think probably four four two was the norm for a lot of teams, and it was very much a box to box thing um, from a midfielder. But in terms of modern day, I think had he been sort of twenty eight, twenty left stoke rather than in his thirties, he'd have joined a, a bigger team than Aston Villa. Um, yeah. He, he would just, well, I say a bigger team than Aston Villa. Some people say that Aston Villa is a huge team, but you, you know, someone else in the Premier League. Um, yeah, like. He he played for us for so long as well. Like yeah. he was with us for basically throughout our entire good period. So that's that's not nine to be years, wasn't it? Nine and a half years. Yeah, yeah, long time. J- just was... missed out on that testimonial yeah. sort of area. Maybe, maybe he'll get one. Like maybe, but then we don't tend to hand them out. Like we give one to Wilco because of his story yeah. and stuff. And Joe Cross will get one because well, he deserves one, doesn't he? But uh, yeah, yeah, it's tough for Wheeling. Underrated though, so maybe you shouldn't get a testimonial because if he does, he'll be rated. So yeah. <laughs> a- attacking midfield, um, there's only one man for this. Mm-hmm. Bojan, <laughs> the little magician. Um, I could say a thousand words about him, but there's only going to be one word that describes him for me: magician. Mm. He, yeah, anything he did. Once he had that ball at his feet, who knew what he'd do? He could ping a pass out to the to the channels. He could drive at the opposition. He he had a very good long shot in him as well. Mm. He was he was fantastic for us. Um, I want, I'm guessing he's made your team. He's not made my team. Oh. Um, I, but <laughs> greatest player is difficult because, like I say, I've I've gone for the greatest team, and I think. For as good as Bojan was, in fact, I'd say he was one of the most talented players to have ever played for us, just because he, he you know, he kept Ibrahimovic and Armory out of Barcelona team. Like, yeah. that says it all. Um, exactly. And he was fantastic for us. We've mentioned his skill, we've mentioned his goals, um, his, like his personality too. Like, he, he was fantastic. He, he was loved by everybody at the club, I think, maybe apart from a couple of managers, but meh, forget that. Um, yeah. But, but, he opened up about his mental health and how difficult it was that he had this reputation of being the next Messi and like being the next Messi is very difficult and you, you need certain yeah. things to fall into place for you and he didn't have them. Um, but whether that was at Barcelona and he kept getting loaned out or at Stoke, you know, he just didn't quite work for him here. And I think that's why he's not made my greatest team simply because, you know, he did get that injury. I don't think he was the worst player after that injury. I think he was a different player. I think he was a bit more tentative in what he was doing. He was still absolutely quality and contributed just as much as he did um, before his injury. I think a lot of people get that twisted. You know, you think he scored more goals after his injury than than before yeah. his injury. Um, but he was a different player. Um, he didn't have that. I'm I'm thinking that goal against Tottenham where he just ran through the entire half of the pitch. Yeah. You wouldn't see him do that anymore, just because 
well, he didn't want to do the same again to his knee, and I can completely understand that. Anyone who's got a big injury playing sport or similar um, will sympathise with that. Um, and he, he just didn't work out, whether it was a case of, yes, his mental health and expectation building up on him, um, whether he was a victim of his own success because managers expected him to be better than he was, whether it was the injury haunting him. like He just didn't quite work out here as I think he should have done. He's a He's a cult hero, and I think there's fair argument to say he'd have made my favourite team, so little spoiler. But, um, yeah, like, greatest team's difficult. Um, yeah, it, it's, the it's thing really that's, tough. The thing as well that I liked about um, Bojan is he never... What was I about to say? <laughs> oh. Podcast is finest, everyone. <laughs> No, I was going to go on about... Um, it'll, it'll come back, it'll come back. <laughs> it'll come back. So, do you want to move on to the wingers slash strikers? Mm. Obviously, yes. I've gone 4 3, three. Yeah. Um, So, for me, my front three is Shakiri, Walters, on our switch. I, it, I think front... front for front... For front... For, uh, for front three, for for a front, oh, yeah, you know what I'm trying <laughs> to say. I'll say for you. I'll start the sentence. You can. For front three, um, you, I think everyone's gonna put that. <laughs> really? Oh, I think <laughs> this is what gonna... you're tuning in for, folks. It's like it's not for the quality stuff. It's it's stuff like this that you're tuning yeah. in for. Um, yeah, Shakiri on Arnautovic. You know, for that 15, 16 season. Those two and Bojan, what could have been? Oh, and I've got my point back about Bojan now. I've got it back. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, I've got my point about Bojan back now. Um, under O'Neill, he would definitely be in this squad. Had we have yeah. kept him, yeah. he would 100% be in that squad. And it's just a shame that he didn't, didn't quite fit Nathan Jones' style. No. Um, had we have kept on yeah, like, I'd, I'd argue that he did. Like, because Jones played that midfield diamond, and at the yeah. tip of the, I think Bojan would have been perfect. The problem is, uh, I mean, we're going on a tangent about Nathan Jones now, and I, I still really like Nathan Jones, let's make that clear. And I think different circumstances he might have worked out, but it didn't work out. And no. we started off so poorly that players like Bojan were... Not luxury players, out. players that yeah we 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 needed them when we were doing well, not when we were doing poorly. He didn't offer that press from the front, which we know that uh, Jones wanted. Mm. He didn't offer any defensive capability, which like fair enough, it's not his game at all. Uh, but it's something that players like Nick Powell did, I think. Um, bit more of a bit more of a physical presence as well, I'd say. Like I don't think I've ever seen Bojan score a header, for example. <laughs> Nick Powell definitely Nick has. Powell's- well, he scored one in the the last game we played against Hull. Exactly, he it was, a, more of a, it was a very more of a good header as well. I think, and Bojan's more of like a creator. And yeah. Just just in that time under Jones, like he didn't even stick to his system where he played two up front. So how the hell he'd have Bojan in there as well? Pfft, yeah. He he. But under O'Neill, under you know, where he does play that sort of two sitting. One Nick Powell normally, yeah. two wingers, one strike up front, big strike like Tyrese or Vokes. Yeah, he'd have, he'd have definitely worked. It'd been absolutely fantastic, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, on out of each, what a player he was. Definitely that season we went down, we did miss his goals. Um, Chupa Moten was all right, but <laughs> yeah, um, on out of each, up there for me. Um, Unfortunately, Arnautovic, in my mind, does get slightly tarnished by the way he handled the transfer and the whole West Ham thing. Um, but, yeah, in a Stoke shirt, what a player. And then Shakiri on the opposite side, um, definitely my favourite player um, for that relegation season. Produced, well, gave me some brilliant moments that I'll remember for the rest of my life. You know, the goal against Leicester, what a goal. He scored the goal against uh, Crystal Palace. Just 
it was that moment that gave everyone a bit of hope and it yeah, all came crashing yeah, down an hour later it was that was it was weird because it had the best moment of the season <laughs> but it also and had the worst. the worst moment that that oh, game was it, it was it was really trying to play with us that game was uh yeah and uh coincidentally martin atkinson was the referee um Jesus Christ, brilliant. <laughs> That's something I do not miss, being in the championship. Um, but yeah, who have you gone for your wingers? I think I might know one. One? Um, Arnautovic. One, yeah. one, one, 100% Mark Um there's, th- there's other players I could have gone for. Um, George Easton, I guess, was one. I, I, I like wing who was very good for Stoke. Um, yeah. But I've gone for Mark Arnautovic. Um like even even through all the past years of Stoke, he's probably one of the best left-sided players we've ever had. Um, yeah. 120 appearances for us. Um, uh, no, sorry, 145 appearances. I'm reading Stephen Zanzi's stats now. Um, obviously, he came from Werder Bremen with this reputation of being unmanageable. Jose Mourinho said, um, and, and we saw that from time to time. Definitely in the early days, um, like he had a bit of a strap on him but again i mentioned this with uh with bunny actually he said um these these players these forward players especially and zonzi was the same you need a hot streak you need like this this bit of fire in your belly sometimes to be the 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 perfect striker you can't just be this level-headed player you need to have that bit where i don't know maybe a defender kicks you and you go Right, I'm 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 having him now, and he did. Yeah. And I it sometimes got so riled up. I remember those two offside goals he scored against West Ham, and I've never seen him play so well after having those two goals marked off for offside. And he finally scored in the end. Um, yeah. I think it was Upton Park, not not the new stadium at the time, not the London Stadium, but uh, yeah, he he was fantastic. His first touch, I've still not seen anybody like that with the first touch. I couldn't name any better players with the first touch. Maybe people mentioned Zidane, but on Atterich's first touch was quality. Um, like his his uh, his finishing got much better with time as he got yeah. more confidence because he said he loved an assist. Like I remember that 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 cross from Crouch that came from like the halfway line, and I just think well, how on earth he scooped that ball in from there. Yeah, and he and he said I just love an assist, and he used to celebrate assists as if they were goals. Um, but then Mark Hughes told him, you know, you can score a goal as well if you want. And he just listened to him and he did. Um, and like when Shakiri came and sort of taken on more of a creative role, that freed Marco just to unleash this yeah. hell of being a physical presence coming in from that left side. Like he worked well as a striker for West Ham and I can completely see why he would be a striker. Possibly could and should have been for us too. Uh, but the thing is coming in, as a striker from the left wing, we saw against Man City, like, you cannot defend against it. He's so big, he's so fast, and he, like, un- unmarkable. Nightmare. Oh, God, yeah. And <laughs> despite the tantrums, despite the way he left, um, some some people wouldn't name him in their favourite team because of the way he left, and I can completely understand that. But yeah, if you're that's... talking greatest team, it has to be. has to yeah. be in there it's, for me. It's, it's, it's the same with me, like, I loved him whilst he was at Stoke. Mm. But then, obviously, the way he handled the transfer, it just completely tarnished the whole thing. Like, I do look back with positive memories, but then, you know, you look at how he's how he treated West Ham um, yeah. when he left. And it we, wasn't personal. We all, predict, we, all saw it, <laughs> we all saw it coming. Yeah, it exactly. Just, I think, yeah. He was a great player for us, but unfortunately handled the transfer the wrong way. And that's I think why his I think agent I've... had a big part to play in some yeah. of these. I, I think on average is probably a good character, but his agent it, it was his brother as well, isn't he, or something like that. And I think he's got a constant whisper down his ear all the time. Um, yeah, so. that's why. That's why I like Shakiri more than I did on Outovich, more yeah. than I do on Outovich now, um, because of the way Shakiri left, he handled mm-hmm. it well. And yeah. if he if we did play Liverpool in the cup next season and he did score I don't think he'd run round in front of the booth and end and do his cross arm thing <laughs> I think he'd just walk off because yeah. you know Shakiri was Shaq was great um, yeah. I love Shakiri I do oh yeah Shakiri was fantastic um, 
he, he doesn't quite make my team, but I, but I mean I'll pay tribute to him. Like those those whole goals is what I remember him for the most. I oh, think magic. The, the free kicks and the long shots. Hull must be glad to see the back of him. Um, yeah. And and you mentioned the free kicker against Palace and uh, what a talented, creative footballer. Like uh, he he came with so much potential. I think he's fulfilling it not to the extent not not one hundred percent. Um, but we fixed his calves, his massive calves, and once he stopped getting injured and it got to that relegation season and he became a world-class player in a squad that was on its arse. Yeah. Um, and he, phenomenal. I think if we'd have had two Shakiris in that team, we'd have stayed up. But yeah. sadly, we signed Hesse and Chupa Um But I've not gone with... Shakiri on the right wing. Um, You've gone for Hesse. We're talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. You got him. That goal against Arsenal. Um, nah, but like if we're talking greatest players, Sir Stanley Matthews has yeah, got to I, be that's, that's in the there. Yeah, I know it's a tough call for people to make because um, again, different eras can't compare. Um, not in the Waddington era when he signed. Uh, much older than that, actually. Um, Signed sort of before World 1950s, War Two, actually. 1940s, um, 1950s, wasn't it? Yeah, that's it. Well, the first time he was at Stoke, um, I'm not sure what age he was when he signed, um, but he joined for a pound a week, um, obviously from Hanley. Um, the club sort of convinced his dad to sign for Stoke um, after I think he was linked with a number of other clubs. Um, eventually signed for his local team in 1931, um, played for us till 1947, then he left for Blackpool. Um, and then... After I think thirteen or fourteen years there, Tony Waddington signed him back again, um, and what a masterstroke that was. Um, mm. uh, Matthews was. I've interviewed Nigel Johnson for the Wow Wow Files, and he spoke about Matthews, wax lyrically like he he yeah. loves Sir Stanley Matthews, and with with fair reason, you know, um, he he was ahead of his time in so many ways. Um, Franz Beckenbauer said um, his speed and skill means that basically no one in the game could stop him. Um, people have said that he's the best crosser that they'd ever seen, despite the ball being very heavy. It was that leather heavy ball. Um, yeah. And yet I, they've still never seen a better cross of a football than that. Um, people say he had everything. He had the, the good close control, the great dribbling ability, lightning quick, intelligent, um, knew how to pass the ball. Um his fitness was unreal you know like he yeah. it, it was ronaldo esque he used to take his lifestyle very seriously um in a time where people didn't take their lifestyle very seriously players smoke players drank yeah. players didn't keep themselves as fit as they did but matthews did and that's why he was able to play on um into his 50s um that's why he played for england um, it's why he was one of the best players of all time, yeah. Re- genuinely. And the fact that he's from Stoke, <laughs> became club president, um, and he he's synonymous with Stoke. I know that a lot yeah. of people will um, relate him to Blackpool as well. But hundred percent. Yeah, so Stanley Matthews is fantastic. And the only Stoke player to ever win a Ballon d'Or. You know that that's you know you think of the Ballon d'Or, you think of Messi, Ronaldo, um, yeah. especially in my time. Um, then obviously, that award means so much. You, you know, that's what Messi and Ronaldo go for every year: the Ballon d'Or, because mm-hmm. that says who's the best player in the world. Yeah. And to have Stanley Matthews win that, it it's, it says everything. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, like well, he, like I say, he was so ahead of his time. Like, yeah, he he might not necessarily been the greatest technical player ever to have existed, but it's because he did everything else right. Like, yeah. he, he was so clever. He even had like lightweight boots made for him, custom boots made for him, because he said the boots that normal players had were too heavy. So he said, "I want lightweight boots." Like. This was back like 50, 60, 70 years ago. He, he, he was just a, I don't know whether he had like a team around him thinking of all this stuff or something, but he was just a bright spark. He was ahead of his time. Um, God knows how much he'd be worth now um, <laughs> if he was playing. He, like we've said sort of incomparable, but like 
not only that, he was a fantastic bloke as well, people said. Like, anyone that's ever met him has said, like, what a humble bloke Stanley Matthews is. And that's not something that could be said about some of the greatest sports people in the world. Um, and, of course, he's from Stoke. And it's... we can't be more proud of him than that. Yeah. Uh, again, I couldn't put it better. He hasn't made my team. Mm. Um, we'll move on to strikers now. But, yeah, Stanley Matthews, definitely one of the best Stoke players ever mm. I think it's definitely out of him and Banks for the best mm-hmm. um, and up front we'll, we'll, look, we'll bring it to a, a close shortly um, but I've gone for John Walters up front yeah yeah. I'd say no more that Pulis team him and Crouchy up front were very very good together you know he was so good he's such a nice guy as well um, and you know we got the goals that mattered, and ultimately shaped a very good um, team. Well, no, spearheaded a very good team up front. Yeah. And you know you look at that 2017 transfer window. We got rid of Whelan and Walters, and then you know you look what happened during that season. You know we didn't replace these characters. But Walters, I mean. We spoke about sort of personality and stuff, and and he was perhaps one of the greatest personalities. Like, there's a reason why managers loved him, and it wasn't just for the yeah. fact that he ran around the pitch and stuff. He he cared genuinely. We've seen like he he was a boyhood Everton fan. Now he's a Stoke fan because yeah. he just threw himself into Stoke City, um, and and he proper proper professionals as we've mentioned with a few of these players. Um, 103 consecutive league starts is it and that's the record for anybody like the fact that he's able to manage that like there's so many things that need to happen for him to achieve that like he's got to stay fit which he did like not only like injury wise he's got to keep his uh, standard levels up too Um, that's across multiple seasons so he's got to survive transfer windows Um, he's, he's got to be playing well to some degree being a striker or when you're scoring goals and even if he's not when you're not scoring goals as a striker or something you can be dropped but Walters wasn't because he was so valuable to the team yeah aside from that but his pressing and his work rate and his leadership in a way um and and he's another one that really genuinely cares and I think it means a lot we've seen so many players perhaps talented players that have come to so in Bula was a very very good footballer but he just didn't care Walters was Fantastic, um, and, and, I, and I think underrated by a lot of people. Like we didn't know what we had until he left with Walters, um, yeah. or at least he was at the team anyway. He's he's one like Whelan where we'd we sort of drop him and then eventually he'd he'd worm his way back in. And yeah, fair fair play to him. I'm I'm glad that his last goal ever was for Stoke and not for Burnley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that that. I keep alluding to it, this 2017 transfer window, the summer transfer window, I think we got that completely wrong. Mm. Um, we didn't replace the quality with quality. We just free transfers and loans, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna do anything special with loans and free transfers. Um and yeah, it was a shame we didn't replace him with a good enough player, I feel like. Chupo Motin was brought in to replace Arnautovic and Walters, which mm-hmm. doesn't work. No. Um, but who who have you gone for up front? So, uh, because you've gone for your attack midfielder, I'll, I'll rattle through my two strikers relatively quickly. Um, my first one is Stoke's all-time top goal scorer, John Ritchie. Uh, I think yeah. he's got 176 goals for Stoke, which is, I, I think it's close to one in two. Like, uh one one goal every two games like consistently and, and apparently that. like he it was insane and uh, I, I, I used to have these periods where he was like injured as well so like he'd like he'd play and it'd take him like a couple of games to to sort of get back up to speed after injury and then he'd yeah. sort of bag hat tricks and stuff and it was just amazing um again part of the Waddington era won the won the league cup um, yeah. sold to Sheffield Wednesday then brought back by Waddington because he admitted it was a huge mistake um, he continued to play for Stoke until basically he broke his leg and that was it, he retired after that 
Um, stayed in Stoke after he retired to continue with his pottery business after that. Uh, I'm not sure what he's doing right now uh, or, or whatever, but uh, yeah. But yeah, John Ritchie, like, as a striker, you need to have scored the most goals to be in the greatest team, I think. Um, people say that other players are more talented. People say that people like Mark Steen were, were like, wonderful um, George Easton as well. I think people would say that he was great as well, but uh, John Ritchie for me is in there. Yeah. Um, and then my other striker, <laughs> I I almost went for John Walters for the reasons that we've just right. gave, um, but I've gone for Cardo Fuller. Um, yeah. And it's tough yeah. because a lot That's of people would say, <laughs> yeah, it, people would say that he's he wasn't the greatest finish in the world, and I would agree. Um, he he missed some some good chances, um, but. He got his promotion along with Lawrence scoring 15 goals each. I think um, he he basically kept us up as well yeah. with his goals and makes everything else with the lap throws and whatever else have you. Um, but but the thing that I put him in for is is because when you put football down to its roots, what do we love to see? Like what does everybody love to see? I I can know at Stoke we love to see like a hard tackle and hard work and graft and like earning your money. But in football, what do you do it for generally? You do it for moments. And Ricardo Fuller produced the best moments, I think, possibly any Stoke player's ever done. Like the, the goal against Birmingham, the goal against Villa, the goal against West Ham, so many other fantastic goals, like ones where he chipped the keeper from audacious angles and and, yeah. and, and ruined players' ankles. And like he, he was a moment maker. He was a maverick. He... We talked about having that bit of a personality up top and a bit of a fiery character. You know, he <laughs> slapped Andy Griffin on the pitch for goodness' sake. Yeah. But uh, like he he cares about Stoke such a lot. He's still in the area now. Um, but, but but the thing for me is he created moments that Stoke will talk about for the rest of their lives. And yeah. for that alone, I think just because there's some clips you'll see Ricardo Fuller and you think what? He had no right to even no. attempt that and yet he made it happen. Um so yeah, maybe not the most prolific goal scorer of all time, but by God, like some of the things he did was absolutely magical and for me that's that's why he's in this team. Yep. I can I can agree with you there. He definitely was one of our best strikers of all time and without him we probably wouldn't be wouldn't have had those moments like the FA Cup run. We wouldn't mm-hmm. have had those ten years in the Premier League. It probably just would have been the one without him. And would we have even got promoted without him? Exactly. He was a massive yeah. part of that as well. And, and yeah, he, he was. He well, he's he's known by many as like their favourite player. I think because um, he's in that area where a lot of Stoke fans joined. Um, and he was the most exciting. So a lot of particularly fans my age, I think, will say Ricardo Fuller got me excited at a time where I was sort of joining Stoke. Yeah. Uh, and they'll say that they're that they're their favourite player because of it, and the fact that he's done that to so many people, inspired so many people in Stoke, and and look at where he's taken the club, not on his own. And I think he's always admitted that he was never on his own. But he was a massive part of that. He was a he completely went against the mould of like work hard, put your foot in, graft. He 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 was the outlet. He was the one that gave relief to defenders and often did more than that. Um, yeah, Ricardo Fuller. That's that's wow. that's the last player in my team, I think. So there are the elevens. Um, pretty decent elevens, aren't they? They they're not bad. <laughs> we 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 do comfortably we do comfortably with them. Um, Who'd win? That's a question. If, if they played each other, different eras. Uh, the, like we in said, the prime, like it's very hard, isn't it? I think in the prime, yours might just edge mine two one. Oh, maybe it's a I good think point. Two one. Maybe we I could do. <laughs> maybe we should take it back and try and do like because they used to do like a, the classic 11s on FIFA, and surely yeah. some of these players must be in there. Um, yeah, maybe someone can do that. Like, do a classic YouTube video and stick Ryan Shawcross's yeah, stats in there it. and something. Do that. That's, That'd that's, be awesome. We can uh, we can make that a part two if you'd want. Um, <laughs> but yeah, 
Ben, thank you very much for coming on. Um, I know it's been a slightly longer podcast than normal, but I think that's we've... my fault. I tend no, to do it's, this. It's, it's, we've had <laughs> we've shared some um, of our favourite Stoke players. Um, we've gone off on several tangents. Um, yeah, we've, it's been a very good hour and twenty minutes. So um, yeah, Ben, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, Ben's podcast, uh, Why 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 Files, will be in the description. Uh, go and check it out. It's actually a really, really good listen. And um, yeah, Ben, again, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Go on, Stoke.